Welcome back to the channel, everybody. I am Mick Alphanin. So we're going to jump into this article here on the CryptoBasic.com. And it's titled, Analyst Predicts XRP Pump to $27. Okay, let's uh, begin right here. It says, XRP is currently set on a path to a price target of $27. According to EGRAG, we've read a little bit from EGRAG before, says who analyzed the assets price movements based on a $2.80 all-time high. I think that was the price that uh, David Schwartz was talking about before, right? He had to correct people. It says EGRAG, a prominent crypto analyst, recently shared insights on the potential triggers that could facilitate an ultimate rally to $27 for XRP. EGRAG's latest analysis is based on a previous disclosure from David Schwartz, Ripple CTO. Now, let me pause there. So if you ever heard me talking about the different ranges for XRP, you know that I don't believe that this is this is far fetched at all. Um, I do believe it'll take some time. I don't think for twenty seven dollars, you know, after the case is over and depending on how fast they deploy everything, you know, they have certain infrastructures already ready to go. That's number one. Uh, tokenization, interbank payments. I mean, any new banks or companies that don't have infrastructures, that's that's where the real um, drag might be. How fast can they deploy for companies that were on the side that don't have infrastructure set up, don't have anything, but they've been interested, but they've held off because of the SEC case? How fast can they actuate on that? I think that'll have a, a lot of weight on how fast XRP's price can go up, if indeed it does go up. You know, um, So I see everything happening in steps and stages, but definitely you know that I believe $27 definitely is possible. Like I said, there's a lot of variables involved. Uh, so anyway, it says EGRAG's latest analysis is based on a previous disclosure from David Schwartz, Ripple CTO, who clarified that XRP's all-time high was $2.80, not $3.20. There was something he was going by that made him say that, by the way, but that's David Schwartz's words. Okay, so this is what EGRAG is going by. And uh, also, let me just throw in there, $27 is not the price I believe XRP can hit. I've never put out my true price. I'll keep that right here, nice and safe. Uh, but it's definitely possible. It's definitely possible, all right? No, it's not a guarantee. So since Schwartz noted that the all-time high value is $2.80, EGRAC used this price as a reference point, plotting the Fibonacci 1.0 level on a monthly candle chart. The Fibonacci levels are set uh, are a set of ratio. We know it. <laughs> we know what Fibonacci is, but let's continue on here. All right, so this next little section, I'm skipping a whole lot. So if you want to read the entirety of this, it was on the front page of thecryptobasic.com, all right? I'm skipping a whole lot here. It says, XRP would need to surge by 5,775%. Considering what they're, they're trying to do, I don't think that's, I don't think that's far-fetched that it could do that. It says, analysts, the analyst revealed, and I'm not saying all at once. Keep that in mind. I'm not saying all at once. I'm not saying overnight. But sky's the limit for XRP, as far as I'm concerned. We will see. It says the analyst revealed that if the price of XRP closes above this confluence, confluence point with a full body candle, it would indicate a confirmation that XRP has bottom. By the way, not financial advice. I'm not a financial advisor. Make up your own minds. All right. It says according to him, such an occurrence would signal that the asset has hit its low point, and investors will not see another opportunity in the future to procure procure it at this price. EGRAG then called attention to the fact that XRP spent almost 1,200 days over three years in the grasp of the bears before staging its previous pump to the all-time high. It says, however, he emphasized that in the current cycle, XRP has spent nearly 2,000 days anticipating for the mega pump. This suggests the current cycle may be due to a significant price it says due to a significant price movement. I think they mean due for a sig significant price movement. It says EGRAG forecasted that XRP significant price run would take the asset to the two to three dollars range. Yeah, so I think I think a lot of us are seeing uh, like the first initial explosion. A lot of us are in that same are around same similar ranges. I personally think three to five dollars, three to three, but we can get two to three dollars first. You know, and then we're looking good anyway. In my humble opinion, you get the one dollar looking good. Actually, you want and leave you sitting on a ton of XRP. But uh, I, I'm thinking three to five. I think it's going to blow past two dollars. I really do. It's it's, it's going to take a little bit of time. 
Maybe give it a couple of weeks. It depends. It depends on catalyst. I'm trying to remain as reasonable as possible. And when everything really begins to occur, like uh, the ending of the case, then we're going to have some observations to make and then we can adjust calculations. I think calculations need to be ongoing. Nothing is set in stone. So I, I try not to keep that mind state. I know what I will want it to be, but what I will want it to be and what is actually happening, which actually occurring is two different things. So we have to continue to take into account all of these different variables uh, of what's going, what is happening at that particular time. And then we'll know uh, where it could possibly go. You know, and then, like I said, Keep in mind, everybody has different allotments of XRP. So if you have two or five XRP, you know that you're going to need some a, a particular price. If you're sitting on 5,000 or 10,000, 200,000 XRP, then you know you're going to need a different price. So each individual has to make up their own minds about what they require out of XRP. You know, and that also affects the timeline, obviously, right? But as of right now, everything is looking good. It's looking real good, in my humble opinion. And Egrag, I, I don't know Egrag, but keep doing a good job because I like what you're talking about. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Let's move on here to a little bit more XRP news. How's everybody Everybody doing out there? You doing okay? I hope so. So this article here is from U.Today, and it's titled, XRP price to tumble before a huge spike. Wait a minute. Now, let me pause there. I think there's a chance, and it, this is because of the economic economic circumstances um things are not looking great right now and and you know liquidity is going to flow from one you know one type of asset into another back and forth constantly uh so i think it's not just xrp that could take a tumble before a huge spike i think a lot of different assets could take a tumble before they have a, a huge spike but let's continue on here it says uh evi ceo matthew dixon has predicted a significant downturn for the price of XRP in a recent tweet. Possible, it does not a guarantee, but it's possible. So he expects the cryptocurrency to first tumble to as low as 34 cents before making a dramatic rebound, potentially surpassing 60 cents. Okay, I can see that possibly happen. It says Dixon, who often uses Elliott, uses Elliott wave theory to analyze market trends, published the message on May 23rd, hinting at an opportunity for high risk reward ratios followed following the predicted price fluctuation for the uninitiated Elliott wave theory. Why is everybody explaining all these, all these things today? I guess it's good for anyone who doesn't know. A lot of newcomers here. It says uh, Elliott wave theory originally developed by Ralph Nelson Elliott in the 1930s is a method used by traders to analyze market cycles and forecast future price trends. I just went and read it anyway. Why not? Just in case anyone doesn't know what that is. It says here, Dixon's tweet referred to this structure implying that the X wave uh, the last impulse wave of XRP would be a minor upward move, followed by a Y curve, a corrective wave to the downside. However, the token is expected to rally after that. Um, this is expected to rally at any time. Everything's in the judge's hands. And everything has been looking extremely positive, especially when you watched the last video about the, those emails um, and SEC sort of getting exposed. I think we're going to see, I think it's possible we may see more of that, right? Uh, so, you know, we'll continue to try to stay up to date on those types of things. But as of right now, we continue to move forward in strength. Now, let's go to another article here. So this article here is from zcrypto.com and it's titled XRP Lawsuit. SEC may have just bitten off more than it can chew as a ripple eyes very big win in case it will be explosive and i can't wait i tell you what i'm very patient but i'm excited for the day that that happens so the prominent speech writer and forbes contributor sam lyman believes the u.s securities and exchange commission may have underestimated the challenges it would face in its legal battle against ripple i agree with that i i, I firmly believe that they in their own minds uh had the solidified thought that everyone was going to roll over and a lot of companies have they just paid the fines. A lot of them went out of business paying the fines. The SEC has been so used to just bullying everyone. They've never had anyone stand up to them like either Ripple, Ripple and the XRP army. They didn't expect warriors to step in, but we did. And that's one of the reasons we're doing so well and setting the precedent for others who may follow in our footsteps. We made history here, folks. No matter how it shakes out, we are a part of history. 
All right, so now let's uh, continue right here. It says the pundit made his observations known on Sunday, May 21, after tweeting that, quote, the SEC may have bitten off more than it can chew in his campaign against XRP. His statement comes in light of an article he recently published on Forbes discussing how the, quote, ripple effects from the lawsuit could benefit not just the XRP army, but also Coinbase and the industry as a whole. Coinbase has been doing some good things as well. They've been saying some good things. So I hope they continue this push and that is genuine. But we will see. It says, led by uh, Chair Gary Gensler, SEC's attempts to classify digital assets as securities has faced unexpected opposition from its past statements and internal documents. Yeah, they got exposed. Those last emails were definitely uh, damaging if what was said about those emails is accurate. It says, which now have, uh, have to be made public due to a recent court ruling. In his article, Lyman suggested that releasing the Hemming documents, which the SEC wanted to keep hidden, could strengthen Ripple's case by revealing that, the, that even SEC staff believe XRP should not be considered a security. Once again, like I said, I'll reiterate, I just need Ripple to win this case. That's it. Whether, whether the public sees the documents or not, I just need a judge to know what's, what's going on with that. Ripple to wield those documents as a weapon. If, if everyone gets to see the documents, fine. Just bring home this victory so we can get on this path. Hopefully, uh, uh, things will kick off and we can start this rocket towards generational wealth. Not riches, generational wealth. All right. So that's that's what I think is important. And I'm keeping my eye on that. All right. Try not to lose focus. It says, quote, the documents are likely to reveal dissenting opinions within the agency's own ranks as to which cryptocurrencies are securities and why. And by doing so, they are likely to bolster Ripple's case, quote unquote, wrote Lyman. The pundit further noted that if the Hemming documents provide more evidence of internal communications contradicting the SEC's current position on digital asset regulation, it could create significant obstacles for the agency's case and reputation. Additionally, and we'll stop right here after this sentence, okay? It would bolster Ripple's argument that the absence of regulatory clarity hindered their understanding of legal boundaries in the industry. Boom. There you have it, all right? So they have a lot more here. Once again, this article is on zcrypto.com. Make sure you check them out. They wrote a lot of good articles today. Them, you dot today. Uh, what was this other article from? The Crypto Basic. These, these websites are doing a great job, in my humble opinion. So show them some love. All right, so now we're going to go to another article from you dot today. A lot of news coming out today, coming out here today. This article is titled Ripple Lawsuit. <laughs> I'm sorry, this, this headline is making me laugh. SEC has never been weaker. <laughs> I know, but that's just fun. I just find that funny. They have never been weaker. <laughs> this is coming from the Sologenic co founder, okay? <laughs> All right. Solo Jenny co-founder is getting tough with the SEC. <laughs> so as the resolution of the Ripple SEC lawsuit nears, Solo Genic co-founder Bob Ross. Woo, got a tough name too, Ross. <laughs> don't, mess with, don't mess with Bob. Says, uh, has taken to Twitter to share his take on the SEC's approach to crypto regulation. Oh, he got a tough picture too. He got the folded off of Bob. His Bob is about business. Don't mess with Bob. Ross claims, <laughs> Ross claims that the crypto industry is already feeling the, quote, ripple effects of the SEC's aggressive approach to crypto regulation. He adds that the SEC is in a weaker position than it ever than it has ever been. OK, then they actually have the tweet here it says the reality is crypto assets are a new asset class. Of course, I agree with that. And treating them simply as securities is to overlook their unique qualities and poten potential. I like how he phrased that. He put that sentence together. It's very potent. The smart move for the SEC would have been to create a regulatory framework that considers the nature of these asset classes. Yes, but they're lazy. And we know that. And they never wanted to do that. And laziness, unfortunately, is a symptom of the legacy system. The banks don't want to do anything. So what do they do? Ask us to hand them infrastructures. Ask us to hand them digital assets. Then they hire a bunch of our people to try to build structures and infrastructures that are similar to our own. Then not only that, come back to us and ask us to, to provide interoperability. And it, it, I mean, it's unbelievable. Anyway, laziness is deeply ingrained in the legacy system. They never innovate. They just steal innovation and try to 
be the main benefactors of those innovations. At least is what I've seen personally. It says recent court developments in the Ripple, at Ripple case shed light on the SEC's inconsistent stance, revealing that there may be a reasonable grounds to conclude that not all crypto assets satisfy the criteria to be classified as securities. The agency's attempt to designate practically all digital, oh, wait, wait, wait. Maybe they're reiterating here what's, what was read in the tweet, I'm, I'm guessing. It says, Ross compares the SEC's approach to that of an old school lawmaker trying to apply outdated laws to a technology it does not fully comprehend. I, well, I really agree with that. Bob Ross, why haven't you spoken before? Your words are fiery and potent, sir. Yeah, step to the front lines and grab yourself a spear and a shield. Welcome to the army. <laughs> Welcome to the fight. Welcome to the war. All right. Okay. I like this. Maybe I should check out Sologenic a little bit more and learn a little bit more about them. I don't know. I like what I'm hearing from their leader. All right. So now let's move on to a little bit of stellar news. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So we're going to go here. This is from this is from BPV. Once again, they are on fire lately. Are you keeping up with BPV and Stellar? So their website is so you can go to their website p.bpventures.us. All right. Go to their articles and news section. You're going to find everything right there. All right. OK, so let's begin right here. It says BPV is excited to announce the free version free of Anchor in a Box a groundbreaking solution designed to simplify integration into the Stellar ecosystem. And this is why I like BPV. Do you know how many businesses this could possibly, not guarantee, could possibly bring in? Where you're offering some integration technology for free? Yes, yes, yes. Keep doing what you're doing, BPV. Right now, you're out front. And there's a lot of companies building on Stellar, don't get me wrong. Right now, you're out front doing a good job. OK, let me um, pull back some of my excitement and let me continue to read here. So it's aimed at two main beneficiaries on slash off ramps and asset issuers. This innovation software offers swift. Hey, that's a little bit interesting wordy, wording there, isn't it? This innovation, I'm just playing around, but yeah, it still is interesting. This innovation software offers swift and simple integrations without having to worry about stellar SEP standards as it supports SEP 1, 6, 10, 12, 24, 31, out the box. Oh, I'm gonna need some more articles from you, <laughs> BPV. <laughs> Don't stop now. <laughs> I like what they're doing, I do. I, I enjoy this company. Is this, they have a lot going on, I do. And anyone who is building on Stellar and really pushing Stellar forward, I'm all for it. it says, whether you plan to offer USDC to, lo to local fiat, launch your own fiat back token, or sell securities such as mutual funds, Anchor in a Box offers something for you. So they can do it for everybody. Yes, this is what I want to see when it comes to Stellar. So it's effortless integration for on slash off ramps. Anchor in a box provides an ideal solution for on slash off ramps looking to connect with a network of fiat and crypto institutions building on Stellar. With just one integration, these entities can effectively facilitate on and off chain transactions, including a wide array of digital assets, including USD stable coins. The software simplifies the process, supports all applicable SEPs offers robust KYC support, flexible fee structures, and comprehensive compatibility with a variety of Stellar wallets. Oh yes, those sweet, sweet Stellar wallets that require lumens. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I want everybody having a Stellar wallet, don't you? Because <laughs> we know what it does, right? Furthermore, it allows for direct transaction functionalities for unsupported wallets ensuring smooth operations at all times like music to my ears empowering asset issuers next section they got a lot here check them out read this article it says uh i can't tell you what to do i'm just saying but this is a good article for asset issuers such as mutual funds seeking to tokenize real world value on the stellar network bring tokenize everything just bring it right to us tokenize it all so Anchor in a Box provides a secure and reliable platform to efficiently manage the purchase process. 
The software comes equipped with advanced tracking and data scheduling features, ensuring accurate reconciliation and streamlined back-end system integration. Holy smokes, they're on fire. They're doing a lot here. The gateway to Stellar Network Integration, BPV's free version of Anchor in a Box, serves as a powerful gateway. Okay, so then they reiterate that there. All right, we're going to stop there. My, my word, BPV, once again, I'm just going to close it out with saying, hey, I enjoy what you're doing. I respect it. You're working hard. You're hungry. I think you're going to bring a lot of great things to Stellar. You already are. So let's leave it there. Let's move on to another article here. So now this article here is titled, well, it's from Newsweek.com and it's titled, Housing market crash fears rise in exclusive poll. Says as the threat of recession looms over the country, a growing number of Americans fear that ho the housing market might, might be heading toward a crash. A Newsweek poll shows a sample of 1,500 eligible American voters were surveyed on May the 17th by Redfield and Wilton Strategies. As an exclusive for Newsweek, I found that 58% of respondents are very or fairly concerned about a possible housing crash in the next year. The housing market is definitely having some problems, of course, um, so in some, some areas more than others, of course. But what I really have my eye on is just commercial real estate. See, well, let's continue on. So some 23% of respondents were only slightly concerned, while 11% were not concerned at all about the risk of a crash. And 8% didn't know how to feel. Well, I, I was reading some articles where there are certain uh, you know, areas where they're trying to bring prices down. Like a lot of stuff is overpriced. They raise the prices up very high. I understand why as well, right? but right now while people are uh, really struggling, I, that's not going to work. Uh, it says here, millennials were significantly more concerned than older generation Xers and boomers. Just over a third, 34% of respondents aged between 25 and 34 years old were concerned about a possible housing crash. Only 20% of those aged 55 and 64 were very concerned and 27% of those aged over 65. The same percentage of respondents aged between 18 and 24 and between 35 and 44, 33% were very concerned about the risk of a housing crash. All right, we'll stop there. Once again, that's on newsweek.com. So now let's go here. So a little bit more home news, housing news. All right, this is from wolfstreet.com and it's titled Home Sales Plunge, Supply Rises, prices drop. That's what I was talking about. So they're trying to like, look, the industry is trying to trying to balance itself out. We just continue to observe, you know, uh, and, and, and make appropriate movements. That's how I feel about that. Uh, I don't listen. I don't like to exist in fear or panic, but I do like to observe and remain remain balanced. And if we have to take precautionary measures, then we definitely will do that. It says, OK, it's spring selling season. The famously best times times of the year to sell a home because that's when prices rise and sales rise due to hot demand from home buyers who were hiding out in the winter. But this year, the median price of all types of previously owned houses, condos and co-ops whose sales closed in April fell year over year by 1.7% to $388,800. The third month in a row of year over year declines, according to National Association of Realtors, a debacle we haven't seen since February of 2012, when the market emerged from housing bust one. From the peak last uh, from the peak last June, the median price declined by six percent. For single family homes, the median price fell 2.1 percent year over year, the third year over year decline in a row, to 393,300. Uh, for condos, the median price still ticked up 0.7 percent year over year to $348,000 says, but it's still spring selling season when prices always rise from one month to the next. Even during house bust one, the median price often rose month to month during spring selling season uh, and si sometimes by quite a bit. And the median price in April was up from March. Okay, let me stop there. Like I said, it, there's so many variables to take into account. You got to take into account, like I said, people are struggling a bit from top to bottom, by the way, top to bottom, people are struggling uh, right now. They're going to be a little bit tighter with their capital, with their funds. 
they're going to be a little bit more um, discerning about their investments also. So here we have uh, an article. It's from the dailyhodl.com. We have to keep up with the dollar, what's going on with it, with de-dollarization. Um, you know, sometimes we keep up with the strength of the dollar as of the last week. For, as far as what I've seen, the dollar has been a little bit stronger. And then you see as the dollar got stronger, you see everything else got pushed down a little bit. Then when the dollar weakens just a tad bit, then everything goes up. You know, this typical pattern here. Uh, but anyway, so this article is from the dailyhodl.com and it's titled Russia and Islamic World Discuss De-Dollarization, Creation of Independent Financial System. All right, let's see what's going on. Russia, and okay, they reiterate what we just read. Russia's Deputy Prime Minister, Alexei Overchuk, says that, says the talks are part of an overall look at, quote, current global shifts, reports the Russian state-funded news organization, TASS. Says Overchuk says the agenda is focused on de-dollarization, financial independence, industrial production, energy, and food security. Quote, of course, our relations with uh, with Islamic countries are influenced by global shifts that are taking place and global trends. We're talking about processes of de-dollarization and the creation of an independent financial system. That breaks currency. I was reading about another country. I can't remember where. It's in South America. They're going to be dealing primarily in yuan for trades. So, I mean, the shirking and dumping of the dollar continues which is something I'm going to pay attention to. We'll see how it shakes out. Maybe maybe not much happens. Maybe it's very impactful and diminishes the value of the dollar. Uh, if we do not research, we will not know. But I'll tell you one thing, I don't want to be blindsided if this is going to be a negative towards the value of the dollar. I think it definitely could be, but I'm going to remain balanced until we get a little bit more information. It says here, Russia has expanded its financial ties to, to Iran after facing a wave of international sanctions due to you know, redacted. Russia's second biggest bank, VTB, just opened a representative office in Iran, uh, reports Forbes. Meanwhile, two uh, uh, Iranian banks are preparing to open physical locations in Russia. So it's just a, it's, it's just BRICS nation activity where they're strengthening their, their relationships. Um, so, <laughs> like I said, my big focal focus point when it comes to BRICS nation is this, just that common currency that they're trying to cook up to replace the dollar as the world reserve currency. That's the significant catalyst there. Um, once we get a little bit more information on that, we'll know a lot more. We'll be able to make a lot more calculations, uh, you know, and uh, be able to have a more clear path pathway of where everything is going. All right, so now let's move on here. So this article here is from investing.com and it's titled Silver dropped as the dollar traded higher. Like I was saying before, dollar got strong. All right. When the dollar gets strong, typically other things come down. Silver yesterday settled down by minus 0.8% as the dollar rose as a as risk aversion prevailed due to growing worries about the state of regional U.S. banks. Everybody's continue to, <laughs> continuing to worry about these banks. Then you have some banks. Con it's mind blowing to me that the trust in the banks is at an all-time low and yet the banks are freezing people's accounts again? Holy smokes, they don't do themselves any favor. I mean, how much bad press do you <laughs> do you need? I guess it's just arrogance, I suppose. Oh well, that's on them. It says the state of regional bank, US banks and an anxiety about the possibility of an unprecedented US, unprecedented US default. Well, like, like I said, they come down to the last hour before. I think they will again. For them to default, I mean, is it possible? Sure, it's definitely possible. If that does happen, people are in for a hurt, hurting. You know, people are in for a hurting. I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Hopefully that doesn't happen because the people on the ground have suffered enough. But we'll see what happens. Says the chairman of the US Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell, made remarks that suggested the Fed would hold interest rates constant at its next meeting in June. They're flip-floppy, once as usual, back and forth. Some are saying it may be, there may be a pause. The Jenny Yellen said that as well, right? She said, well, there could be a pause because the banks are tightening enough. Then you have others coming out and saying, well, no, we, we need to continue to raise rates. So it's just flip-floppy. We'll, we won't know anything solid until the actual decision is made, right, announced. So Powell stated at a research conference at his bank that, quote, the risk of doing too much or doing too little are becoming more balanced. 
and our policy adjusted to reflect that, unquote. Powell continued, quote, we haven't made any decisions about the extent to which additional policy firming will be appropriate, unquote. Even if the unemployment rate starts to climb later in the, in the year, the U.S. Federal Reserve must continue to be super strong. Oh, there we go. All right. So it, <laughs> I see why people believe that there's going to be another increase. And, you know, I said all along that it should have been higher uh, and they should have done it earlier. Rip the Band-Aid off. That, that's how I feel. Get it over with. It's going to happen anyway. I mean, all the negatives are going to come. You have to crush the economy because you inflated it. It's just it's a necessary thing. It says, but Bostic warned that if it starts to increase, public pressure on the institution will be, quote, enormous. Sales of, I've never stopped them before. Sales of silver products at the Perth Mint grew to their highest level since October of last year in April. Contrarily, month sales of silver increased 6.8% to 1,940, I mean, sorry, 1,000, my apologies, 1,947,743 ounces. So I'm never worried about silver. I'm never, never worried about gold at all. It's just my humble opinion. That's all. Uh, you don't have to agree with, agree with me. I'm not forced, trying to convince you to agree with me or anything like that. I just personally feel that because of harsh economic circumstances, lack of trust in the banks and the possibility of a wave of bankruptcies coming, uh, 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 harsh economic circumstances, if I didn't say it already, uh, the possibility of other banks also collapsing, that's definitely possible, uh, that I think silver, gold, and platinum are going to be solid for a while. At least silver and gold are going to be solid in my humble opinion, into the future and could could go a little higher. Could, not a guarantee, but could go a little higher. All right, so now we're going to close out with this article here. It's from finance.yahoo.com and it's titled, Cut Stocks, Buy Gold, Hold, hold Your Cash. JP Morgan's Kalanovic says, so there's a debt ceiling negotiation that remains in limbo Elevated recession risk and a hawkish Federal Reserve stance are just a few of the reasons J.P. Morgan Chase and Company's Marco Kolanovic is advising clients to further dump equities and hold on to cash. It says a team of J.P. Morgan strategists led by Kol Kolanovic trimmed its allocation to stocks and corporate bonds while boosting its stake in cash by 2%. Within the commodities portfolio, the firm also rotated out of energy and into gold on haven demand and as a debt ceiling hedge, another move intended to strengthen J.P. Morgan's defensive posture. Quote, hopes of a swift re resolution to the U.S. debt ceiling have somewhat bolstered market sentiment. Unquote, Kolanovic uh, wrote in a note to clients. Quote, despite last week's rebound, risk assets are failing to break out of this year's ranges. And if anything, credit and commodities are trading at the lower end of this year's ranges. With equities trading close to this year's highs, our model portfolio produced another loss last month, the third loss in four months. U.S. stocks treaded water Tuesday as investors awaited answers from Washington on what the federal government will do to avert a catastrophic default. All right. And we know how that's been going. <laughs> you know, they're back and forth. They don't know what they want to do. One minute they're on good terms. One minute they're not. You know, we will see what happens. You know, we've taken enough precautionary measures to protect ourselves from whatever may come and, you know, to thrive if it doesn't come. So now that you have that information, what are you going to do with it? I know what I'm going to do with it. So until next time, let's get to the money.